So this is now part E uh, of chapter three. And we're gonna talk about intermittent positive pressure ventilation or, or an intermittent positive pressure breathing. Uh, this is, for argument's sake for this portion, we're gonna talk about a mechanical breath, essentially where you're increasing intrathoracic pressure, increasing lung volume, but you're doing it without any peep. So this is also known as ZEEP, which is one of my favorite uh, physiologic acronyms, and ZEEP is zero and expiratory pressure, which is something we rarely do in the intensive care unit because of these notions of physiologic PEEP or physiologic FRC or things like that. I don't know if there's a whole lot of evidence to suggest that that exists, and I think even maybe in the in Merino and the Blue Book, they, they cite some articles that it doesn't exist, but that's sort of be, um, besides the point. So returning to the um, this epic Venn diagram of chapter three, we're working our way through it. We're teasing out the effect, we're volume and pressure effects. We're understanding heart lung circulation, heart sorry heart lung interaction. Part A was increased lung volume and its effects. Part B was decreased intrathoracic pressure only without lung volume and its effects. And I coined these uh, this the mini Mueller. Part C was the two of these together and its effects decrease intrathoracic pressure and an increase in lung volume. And that's obviously a spontaneous breath. Then in the part D, we talked about just an increase in intrathoracic pressure without an increase in lung volume. And that was the mini Valsalva. And now what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the two things here together. Increased lung volume with increased intrathoracic pressure. And this is a mechanical breath. So, um, intermittent positive pressure ventilation, I'll use this to demote, denote a completely passive patient being passively mechanically ventilated without PEEP. Um, this physiology will, re will reflect repetitive increases in intrathoracic pressure with an increase in transpulmonary pressure and therefore lung volume. Recall from chapter one that an increase in airway pressure is related to but not equal to the increase in intrathoracic pressure which we will consider to be plural pressure for the discussion. That's a pretty wonderful uh, run-on sentence right there. Sorry about that. Uh, also recall that the increase in plural pressure or intrathoracic pressure tends to follow the chest wall elastance curve. In the, uh, I don't know how many times I can say this, but in the um, completely passive patient who's not making any inspiratory efforts on the ventilator, the change in plural pressure is equal to in the numerator, the change in lung volume over in the denominator, the change in che or the chest wall compliance. So um, the change in lung volume in turn is determined by the lung compliance uh, itself. But as you apply a volume from the ventilator to the lung, the lung expands and the lung expands out against the chest wall. And so therefore the, the compliance is therefore determined by how stiff the chest wall is as the lung presses out against it. And I use the um, balloon in the box analogy in a number of my lectures. If you want a quick review, you can go to the introductory lecture, uh, chapter three, four. So let's just review briefly the difference between plural and airway pressure. Again, this is the modified Campbell analysis. Um, I haven't labeled it very well, and I apologize for that. Again, on the x-axis, this is uh, plural pressure or intrathoracic pressure, as we've seen in many of these diagrams already, this point represents zero or atmospheric pressure. This is pressure above atmosphere. This is pressure below atmosphere. Again, this is in centimeters of water. This is your lung elastance curve. This is your chest wall elastance curve here. And then this curve here, it's modified Campbell analysis because this curve here is not really part of the normal Campbell analysis. This is the compliance or elastance curve of the respiratory system. That's the RS. This is chest wall and this is lung. So this curve reflects a summative um, compliances of the lung and chest wall together. And I've color coded it here to indicate why that's the case. So at each successive increase in volume, um, the pressure between the lung and the chest wall, this lateral distance here, this pressure here, represents the pressure that the muscles of inspiration must generate to shift the chest wall compliance curve leftwards during a spontaneous breath or convert to, to achieve this static volume. 
or conversely you could look at it as the amount of pressure that must be applied to the proximal trachea to expand the lung and chest wall to this particular volume. Okay, I hope that's clear because it's kind of important for a lot of the diagrams um, in a lot of my lectures. So increasing the thoracic volume by a positive pressure breath will result in a change in the peak and plateau pressures, which is different from the change in the pleural pressure. Again, so because these are static volume changes here, um, this summative respiratory system compliance is the, is the compliance of the static respiratory system, is what I should say, is that this is just the compliance curve um, for the lung and chest wall together that says nothing about um, the, uh, the, the amount of pressure that must be applied to affect gas flow. And I think I talk about this in chapter one, but this elastance curve of the respiratory, the compliance curve of the respiratory system, this is essentially like a series of plateau pressures. Um, if you want to think in terms of ICU physiology, if you were to take a patient and give them volume green on the ventilator and measure a plateau pressure, and then give them volume red and measure a plateau pressure, that would be here, and give them volume, um, I don't know what this is, some sort of blue, I'm kind of <laughs> colorblind, teal, I don't know. Um, give them this volume and measure the plateau pressure, and then give them volume um, dark blue and measure the plateau pressure. This is just a series of plateau pressures. And you can see how that flows from the, the compliances of the lung and the chest wall together. So again, plateau pressure curve, airway pressure curve. So if I were to increase the lung volume with a breath from FRC up to this dark blue volume like that, um, the compliance curve for the chest wall, again, is what approximates the pleural pressure volume relationship. So what you would measure on the ventilator would be very different. You would measure this change in airway pressure. And this is the peak pressure because this takes into consideration airways resistance. And the greater to the right, this, is, this curve of shift represents greater airways resistance. So a greater pressure must be delivered at the proximal trachea to, to generate flow. Whereas this pressure, as we mentioned, represents the plateau pressure at the end of inspiration. So this would, uh, this would be the peak pressure that you would measure off the ventilator. This would be the plateau pressure that you would measure off the ventilator. Okay, but the pleural pressure is way over here, and the pleural pressure, as we mentioned, is is um, determined by the change in lung volume and the chest wall compliance in the passive, potentially paralyzed patient on the ventilator who's not um, changing their, there's not has no uh, muscle, no respiratory muscle activity, so they're not changing the compliance characteristics. Uh, of the chest wall compliance curve. They're not shifting the chest wall compliance curve leftwards or rightwards. So let's talk about IPPV uh, and the right ventricle. To the extent that the airway pressure that we saw is transmitted to the pleural space, the right atrial transmural pressure will decrease and the right ventricular preload will shrink. By the same token, right ventricular afterload would tend to de decrease as a function of the increased pleural pressure because as, as we talked about, as the preload decreases, the uh, max wall tension on the RV during systole would tend to decrease, and therefore there's kind of conflicting effects here. Oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's conflicting effects because during the increase in lung volume that you get with a mechanical breath, there's an increase in the transpulmonary pressure or lung volume and as we talked about, that would tend to increase pulmonary venous resistance, therefore increase pulmonary outflow impedance, and therefore increase right ventricular afterload. So the, the effect on the RV is difficult to predict, um, but preload reduction um, tends, to be, uh, tends to be the predominant effect when the lungs are of normal compliance and volume. And this, this understanding this physiology is more important that we, when I talk about um, particularly the difference between pulmonary ARDS and extrapulmonary ARDS as proposed by Gattinoni and colleagues in the late 90s. Uh, and I talk about that in chapter four on my, on my 
section on ARDS uh, in terms of how increasing airway pressure via a mechanical ventilator has different effects on the right ventricular preload and afterload depending on whether or not a decrease in your thoracic compliance is due to a decrease in your pulmonary compliance versus a decrease in the chest wall compliance. As you may suspect, um, and if you're interested, you can skip ahead to chapter four on the ARDS, that if chest wall compliance is decreased, there's more of an increase in intrathoracic pressure and therefore more of a preload effect, whereas if, if your pulmonary compliance is decreased, there tends to be an increase in your transpulmonary pressure and therefore more of an afterload effect. Okay, so this is again the modified Campbell analysis into the page, the z-axis. Okay, I've labeled it here. This is the pleural or airway pressure in centimeters of water, and it's the pleural pressure dependent upon the chest wall compliance curve here in, the, in this passive patient. And it's the airway pressure um, based on this uh, summative compliance curve of the respiratory system. Okay, that's the airway pressure. And again, this curve to the right, this is the static um, respiratory system compliance curve, uh, and this is the um, dynamic respiratory system uh, compliance curve off to the right. So in this patient, in this modified Campbell analysis, if I were to take them from functional residual capacity and give them a positive pressure breath, well, what would happen? Their airway pressure would increase along um, uh, above atmospheric pressure, so their airway pressure would go from say here up to here following the dynamic and static uh, compliance curves of the respiratory system. But the increase in pleural pressure as we just saw will increase along the chest wall compliance curve. So the pleural pressure will rise from there to there. Again we say we're on a volume limited mode of mechanical ventilation and we've dialed in I don't know 500 cc's and that's it's going to give 500 cc's up the volume uh, up the z-axis here, up the volume curve, and therefore the change in pleural pressure will follow the chest wall compliance curve, and the change in airway um, pressure, as we just saw, will follow the, the um, compliance curve of the respiratory system. So now let's go over this same physiology, but now let's superimpose the Guyton analysis. So this is your right ventricular cardiac function curve. Again, blood flow on the y-axis, and now we have um, um, essentially right atrial pressure on the x-axis. Again, atmospheric pressure, below atmospheric pressure, above atmospheric pressure. This is your venous return curve. So the application of um, the positive pressure breath will increase your intrathoracic pressure and therefore your x-intercept of your cardiac function curve, as we talked about, will shift from functional residual capacity at and expiration, and it will shift along the pleural pressure or intrathoracic pressure curve of, as we saw the intrathoracic pressure increase from here to here. So the positive pressure breath would tend to shift the cardiac function curve rightwards, lower your right ventricular output transiently, and decrease the right ventricular and right, right atrial and right ventricular transmural pressure. Okay? But, um, oh, I just talked about that. The increase in lung volume during the breath um, remember we talked about in part A, oh sorry, I'm going to talk a little bit about the afterload at first here. The increase in lung volume tends to impair the RV afterload while the diminished radius of curvature tends to unload the afterload, so the effect is a bit of a wash and there's probably essentially no difference in health. Okay, but as we talked about in part A, um, the increase in the lung volume, remember we're adding on that center, center part of the Venn diagram, increase in lung volume um, decreases the capacitance of the um, systemic venous capacitance beds. So you tend to shift your mean systemic pressure rightwards, you tend to shift your venous return curve rightwards, and again, as we talked about, whether you maintain uh, re resistance to venous return or increase resistance to venous returns will depend on your underlying volume status. And if you're on the hypervolemic side as you increase your uh, intrathoracic pressure, um, you'll tend to maintain IVC flow, but if you are on the hypovolemic side, you may actually um, increase the resistance to venous return and diminish uh, flow to the right atrium and right ventricle. So I hope that's clear from this diagram. So now moving on to intermittent positive pressure ventilation and the left ventricle.
again, there's going to be, as we talked about, um, spontaneous ventilation and its effects on the left ventricle. There's going to be, there can be conflicting um, effects, and it's it can it can be very confusing. <laughs> believe me, when you're reading the literature, um, in terms of the response of the left ventricular dimensions and compliance and response to a positive pressure breath. And I'm trying to keep it as simple and straightforward as possible. So increased pleural pressure on the left ventricle, um, as I mentioned, is paradoxical. There's opposing effects. Some of the effects serve to increase left ventricular filling while some oppose left ventricular filling. And the ultimate effect is dependent upon the balance of non-uniform forces attempting to shrink the left ventricular cavity against those favoring left ventricular distension. And what's interesting or, or important is that the cyclic nature of, of IPPV or, or intermittent positive pressure ventilation tends to reverse any effect caused by inspiration during expiration. So it's kind of a reversible cyclical change. So determinants of left ventricular preload during intermittent positive pressure ventilation. So if you if there's diminished diastolic ventricular interdependence, um, and this would occur uh, in, a, in the hypovolemic patient or the patient with a low volume status, um, it will be determined by the, the RV function, and it will also be determined by the onset of increased pleural pressure during diastole. Um, there's also increased pulmonary venous return with an increase in transpulmonary pressure. As we've seen, as the lung volume increases, it tends to squeeze blood out of the lungs. And again, it's dependent on the lumped zonal characteristics of the lung. There's, if there's more west zone 3, you tend to get more pulmonary venous return. And um, these effects would tend to increase your left ventricular and diastolic volume. Um, sorry, where was I? <laughs> it's a party on, there's a party going on outside. Um, so what are the effects that would tend to um, diminish left ventricular and diastolic volume? Well, if there's diminished afterload, you can imagine if the, if the LV is ejecting better than if it gets more of its uh, stroke volume out. Subsequent beats would tend to have a lower end diastolic volume. So if the onset of the increased pleural pressure occurs during systole and uh, parenthesis, um, you'll augment left ventricular ejection and subsequent be beats would tend to have lower end diastolic volume. And similarly, if you have compression of the left ventricular free wall by the expanding lung, there may be a diminished left ventricular end diastolic volume. Now in the healthy patient with a normal increase in lung volume during ventilation uh, and a normal volume status, there tends to be a cyclical increase and decrease in left ventricular stroke volume as a function of right heart variation and stroke volume. So it's more of a, a preload into the RV um, that is determining um, this change in, in left ventricular output. It's the cyclical change in intrathoracic blood volume that is driving this, um, uh, ch these transient changes in left ventricular output. With the increase in intrathoracic pressure, the left atrial pressure does not increase relative to the atmosphere. Again, for um, uh, repetition, the, uh, with, if you just take the intrathoracic, the direct intrathoracic pressure effects on, pulmonary, on the pulmonary veins and the left heart cardiac function curve, they're, they're shifting in tandem. Um, but the pulmonary veins are subject, because the pulmonary veins are subject to the same ambient pressure. Um, so I'm not, il il I'm not illustrating this tandem shift. But the increase in lung volume, as I've talked about multiple times already during this chapter, does uh, decrease the pulmonary venous capacitance beds, or the, the decreases the capacitance of the pulmonary veins, uh, which tends to shift the pulmonary venous return curve to the right relative to the left ventricular cardiac function curve. And again, this is the modified Campbell analysis um, with intermittent positive pressure ventilation. We're applying um, positive pressure at the proximal trachea. Say we've dialed in a volume. We're starting at FRC here, and we're going to move to FRC plus your tidal volume up there. The airway pressure will increase along the dynamic and static compliance curves of the respiratory system. And again, this is a summed curve. 
of the chest wall, lung and chest wall compliances together. So that represents the increase in your airway pressure, centimeters of water here, from say about here to say about there. And you can measure that on the ventilator. But the increase in the pleural pressure in this passive um, patient who's not generating any inspiratory or expiratory efforts will move along the chest wall compliance curve. As the lung is increased to the tidal volume you've dialed in, the lung presses out against the chest wall. And if the chest wall is normally compliant, you'll have a normal increase in your pleural pressure along that curve. Okay, so again, now let's make this the Guyton analysis. So now we have blood flow on the, Z on the, on the Y axis here and right atrial pressure on the x-axis, venous return, right heart cardiac function. Again, we will see that the increase in intrathoracic pressure um, shifts the cardiac function curve rightwards from its baseline at FRC to its new increase in pleural pressure here. The transmural distending pressure of the right atrium and right ventricle has shrunk. Your right atrial pressure has increased, but your cardiac output has decreased as a result of this um, uh, positive pressure breath. Okay, so what does this do now? I've this your right heart has become a ghost. What does this do to your left uh, left heart cardiac function or your left heart physiology? Well, this is your left ventricular cardiac function curve. This venous return curve is now pulmonary venous return. Um, the decrease in right ventricular volume that you get immediately with the increase in intrathoracic pressure may very briefly improve the left ventricular cardiac function curve by making it more compliant. Therefore, you might get a little bit of a shift up into the left. You might have a very transient improvement in, in your in your uh, right ventricular, or sorry, in your left ventricular stroke output. Uh, the increase in lung volume can compress the LV free wall. Um, uh, but this, this effect really tends to be minimal, if anything at all, at normal lung volumes in healthy patients. Um, and the positive pressure tends to unload the LV. So you may have like small variations in your, in your left ventricular cardiac function curve, but probably in totality not much of a change at all. Um, but importantly, the pulmonary venous return curve will shift to the right as lung volume increases. And again, it's sort of similar to the abdominal physiology that depending on your volume status, you'll get more or less um, preload to the, to the left ventricle depending on the, on the zonal characteristics of your lung. The more west zone three is, the more venous pulmonary venous return you'll get. Now what I don't have illustrated here is that, um, you know, with the increase in lung volume, uh, you kind of squeeze blood out of the out of the lungs into the left ventricle. So if this is your end expiratory baseline, the increase in lung volume, the, uh, the squeezing of blood out into the left ventricle tends to be the predominant effect, as you can see by this um, graph. So you tend to have have a um, uh, an inspiratory augmentation of cardiac output. Now you can see from the ghost of the right ventricle here that during the inspiratory breath you actually really significantly decreased right ventricular output. So what's going to happen and what I don't have illustrated here is that this is what I've just illustrated as inspiration. If I were to illustrate expiration, uh, well the cardiac, the right ventricular cardiac function curve would shift right back leftwards to its baseline at FRC but during expiration, the um, venous return to the left heart, so the pulmonary venous return curve, what we have here, may actually shift somewhat leftwards relative to its end expiratory baseline. And that left shift in the, in the pulmonary venous return curve is a reflection of the inspiratory decrease in right ventricular output. So this, can be very confusing and maybe your mind is spinning right now, but um, you can sort it. I think this has been described um, by, um, I think it was Jardin's group in the early 80s. They, they talked about, you know, what's driving the cyclical changes in left ventricular output during positive pressure breathing. And you can sort of think of it as like a piston that the, if you were to uh, uh, initiate mechanical ventilation in a patient, you'd, you'd have increases, inspiratory increases in LV output, primarily as an increase in venous return to the left heart, and then you'd have expiratory decreases in LV output, and that is actually a reflection 
of the inspiratory diminution of right ventricular output that occur during during inspiration. So you kind of have this piston-like effect where the lung is expanding and squeezing blood into the LV and then the lung is, contra is contracting on expiration and sort of um, then becoming filled with blood from the RV as it increases its ejection during expiration and then during the subsequent inspiration then the increase in lung volume squeezes more blood into the LV and it's the cyclical piston-like effect and that's really the key um, determinant of the cyclical changes in, in blood in, in left ventricular output during intermittent positive pressure breathing um, in the left ventricle and I think I talk about those in this next slide um, So in the healthy uvolemic patient, this phenomenon is driven mostly by discharge and acceptance of the pulmonary venous blood during inspiration and expiration, respectively. So cyclical stroke volume variation is also affected by uh, changes in RV preload and much less so um, left ventricular afterload. So that was it for um, spontaneous, well, that was it for um, a mechan mechanical breathing, essentially, in the, in the normal healthy patient. Uh, and now we're going to talk about what happens when you add on a little bit of positive end expiratory pressure in the in this final portion of chapter three.